Ricky. So nearly three quarters of Jude's letter is dealing with vivid descriptions of the dangers that his readers were facing. And if he accomplished nothing else, he wanted them to be sure he wanted to be sure that they did not underestimate their adversaries or the seriousness of the situation that they were in. And as he neared the letter, as I said already, he had turned his attention to practical instruction for those whose faith was under assault. Um, he was giving Christians what they can do when they find themselves confronted by worldliness in the church. And this is something that we've got to be careful of. We have got to be careful because we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We've got to be careful. And when we see the world creeping in, then we're creeping away from being the church that God wants us to be. And so Jude's first bit of advice was to build yourself up on your most holy faith. We read that in verse 20. Brethren, when problems are properly addressed, they're not insurmountable obstacles. When they're properly dressed, we can overcome these obstacles. Actually, they can be opportunities in disguise. Um, somebody read James 1, verses 2 through 5 for me, please. James 1, verses 2 through 5. Thank you, sir. So they, trials and tribulations and turmoil can be an opportunity. And James, and what, and what Mike just read, is that we should count it all joy because it gives us the opportunity for personal growth. It gives us the opportunity to test what we're made of. You know, we used this illustration the other night uh, in, in Terrence's class on Wednesday about being UL listed. You know, if you, if you buy a hair dryer or something and you look at that tag at the bottom and it's got that big UL, that means it's gone through all kinds of tests to prove that it will stand up. And what James is telling us is it's all about attitude. And Jude would echo that as well. It's all about attitude and how we approach the, the, the turmoil and the trials that, that face us. And the Bible, the Bible frequently speaks of spiritual growth in the terms of building. The, the Hebrew writer compared immature Christians to an unfinished structure consisting of a foundation with no superstructure. You can find that in Hebrews 6 1. Um, and he he encouraged them, he exhorted them to complete what they had begun building in their spiritual lives. He did he encouraged them to continue to build it tall and build it strong for the glory of God. And brethren, both individually, Van Herndon, you we need to work on that, but also collectively as the church, as the congregation. We should always be growing in this way, moving closer and closer to God and doing so through the understanding of his word and the application of that word. And so Jude places the responsibility for such growth squarely on the shoulders of his readers. Now, I want you to understand it's our responsibility, but Jude, God doesn't expect us to do it alone. We have God's help, but even with God's help, it requires serious effort on our part, on the, the part of Jude's audience that he wrote the letter to. Understand that God has provided every encouragement. God has provided every resource necessary for mature development. But brethren, we as the saints, we must take advantage of the means that he makes available. And so understand that it's a cooperative nature. We have our part. God has his part. God is doing his part. part. Um, 
the cooperative nature of, of this, this enterprise, if you will, is evident from Paul's command to work out your own salvation. That, that doesn't mean figure out how to get to heaven on your own. That's not what that is saying. What that is saying is you've got a plan and now you've got to put the work in. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so we've got to do our part. Um, Christians must build themselves up. And the foundation of all such building that we're talking about this morning is faith in Christ. Um, now, if you talk to any number of people, you may get what, what this, this faith that he's referring to, this most holy faith. We'll talk about the most holy in a minute. You know, but, but you know, just to, if you ever run across these questions... And, and Johnson, that, that we're taking this lesson from, he addresses this. He, you know, what kind of faith? Does, it, does he speak of an objective faith or does he speak of a subjective faith? It, is it the plan or is it the belief? Does he, ref, you know, it, it, again, does he refer to... Does he refer to the personal belief or does he refer to what is being believed? Understand both are necessary for growth to occur and both are implied <coughs> excuse me in this passage um, you can't be built up if you have all the right information but you don't believe it you know it's it's there's people in this world today that probably know the Bible better than most but they don't believe it they studied it for a different reason they used it as a, studied it as a to, to, to develop an argument against it um, and you can have all the belief, all the, the zeal in the world, but if you don't know the right thing, then you can't be built up by believing in error. Um, and so, and just like, you know, we see that as an example in the Bible, you know, Saul of Tarsus, you know, he was, he was a zealot. He, he, he was a Hebrew's Hebrew, a, a Pharisee's Pharisee. Uh, studied at the, the feet of, of Gamaliel, and yet he missed the coming of Christ. He, and, and so he was, he was enthusiastic, but he was enthusiastically wrong. So we have to have the right information, and we've got to have the belief in the right information in order for us to build ourselves up. And so true progress demands personal trust in Christ and in his teaching. And Paul indicated where this source of faith comes from. Can anybody just quote Romans 10, 17? We ought to be able to in this room. <laughs> faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And by the way, that's the password for the Wi-Fi in the back. Um, just because the, for the assistive living, listening. I'm so proud of myself for that, and nobody thinks it's funny. But the assistive listening Wi-Fi, the password is Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God because it's assistive listening. You know, two of you are smiling and laughing. The rest of you are like, I don't get it. Come on, guys. All right, I'll move on. And, and, and Amy's just shaking her head at me like, yeah, I married him. Uh Bless his heart. Um, this means, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What this means is Christians must build themselves up by studying the Bible. I don't know if you've ever heard me say that before. Um, we've got to study the Bible. Terrence, have you, have, I mean, you, no, let me, let me, so, we spent the last three days living an hour ahead, and then we come back, and then it moves back to, hours. we don't know what time of day it is. Because there's like, you know, traveling across a time zone during a time change, I, I, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon for me right now. I don't know. We've got to study the Bible. You know, in preparing the Ephesian elders to withstand the false teaching, um, Paul said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to watch it build you up Acts 20 32 
Jude called this faith most holy. Holiness indicates something sacred, something special. You know, in the Old Testament, we had the Sabbath. It was holy because it was unlike, due to God's commands, like unlike any other day of the week. The temple was called holy because it was different from all other buildings. The Bible is called holy because there's no other book in the entire world like it. Faith whether objective or subjective, is most holy in a number of ways. It's special because, number one, it's source, divine revelation. It is given to us by God. It is unique because it has the power to save souls and the power to transform lives. Those who possess faith are different from those without that faith they are distinct in the one that they worship and in the way that they worship Um, they are different because of their values and their standards and I'm describing what we should be Um, they we are in the world but not of the world we're called saints saints means separated one so we've We've got to build ourselves up, and we've got to build ourselves up by the divine standard, and that divine standard is God's Word. And we've got to set ourselves apart according to that standard. Now, the next thing that he says, let me go back and read the verse real quick. He says, beginning in verse 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, what we just covered, praying in the Holy Spirit. So Jude's second admonition, his second bit of instruction was for Christians to pray. I'm going to stop right there and ask a a self-reflection question. What's your prayer life look like? Don't answer me, but answer yourself. Um, There's a need for constancy and consistency in prayer and you can't overemphasize this as a matter of fact Michael what was at the end of the verse you read in James I caught you off guard I'm sorry I got caught off guard in the conference this week and I sounded like I, I sound like Mel Tillis for about a good 30 seconds James 1 2 through 5 I'm probably looking at verses Verse 5 is what the answer to my question. And how do you ask God? What avenue do you ask God? Prayer. We need to go to God. We cannot overemphasize this. You know, Jesus and the apostles stressed the value um, of spiritual discipline. Somebody and, and prayer and somebody somebody read First Thessalonians five seventeen if you just can't quote it off the top of your head. It's one of those and you'll recognize it when you read it. Pray without ceasing. Now, does that mean wake up, start praying, go to bed, pray till you go to bed, pray while you're asleep? No, it, what it pray without ceasing means develop a regular fervent, I would add, habit of praying. Jude, Jude, Jude's friends had many things to say. To, to, uh, Jude's friends had many things to, to pray about because of the ordeals that they were facing. Um, you know, even today, I, I would say that as a congregation, we're blessed, but we, but we have things that we need to pray about. You know, they, they needed to pray for the church. They needed to pray for the elders in the midst of the crisis that they were facing. They needed to pray for their enemies. And God tells us to do that. Pray for our enemies. Is that something easy to do? You know, but but you think about it. Ask, you know, praying for your enemies. Ask God to thwart their purpose and soften their hearts. Um, not pray for their success necessarily in their endeavors, but you know, pray pray for them to, to turn towards a right path. Um, 
They needed to ask for personal strength to remain faithful and to, to boldly defend sound doctrine. And, and, and brethren, that's something that I see. We have got to defend sound doctrine. Um, now, there are issues, there are things in the Bible that I would say are more academic and not a salvation issue. But when it comes down to a clear salvation issue, we have got to defend sound doctrine and they needed and we need divine assistance in edifying the saved and recovering the lost we have got to make sure that we are building each other up we have a responsibility we are the body of Christ you know if if, if I stub my toe which you know your toe is just basically a way to locate the furniture in the dark uh, if I stub my toe my whole body feels it um, if one of you hurts we should all feel it if one of you is lacking we should come in and, 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 and fill in until we can get you to the point where you're not lacking we are a body we, we, we are individuals but we are members of the body of Christ and we have got to act like that body. And I can't drive home that biblical metaphor enough that, that we, we are connected. And so, and we've got to edify, we've got to build each other up. And then we've got to make sure that we do what we can to recover the lost. Because using the body metaphor again, when someone strays away, we're losing part of the body. Spiritual patriots must have access to God's power if they to be, are to be victorious. And Jude called on his readers to pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, that's another one of those, you know, Johnson that we're taking the study from. He addresses, okay, what is praying in the Holy Spirit? And he, he offers up what may be, but then he comes to a conclusion as what is important. But, it, you know... He says that it's possible that he was referring to the exercise of miraculous power in the first century because we know that there was miraculous gifts, uh, that there was gifts of the Holy Spirit and passed along, you know, but, but, but that's not a certain conclusion. That's just, he, he's offering that just to kind of um, placate those who would make that argument. Um, but whatever Christians do, we should do it in the Spirit. Paul called for believers to, to, to walk in or be led by the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16, and 18. And whenever we act, you know, we need to make sure that we act in love and kindness and it, that, it that love and kindness manifest itself in the lives of God's people. Um, and, and doing so, you know, we have the fruits of the Spirit in verse, Galatians 5, 22 through 25. And so, you know, that, that's the fruits of the Spirit, the works of the Spirit. So loving and praying, although not miraculous, are divinely induced behaviors. Understand what I'm saying there. You, you, you can pray and it not be miraculous. You can love and it not be miraculous. The miraculous age is gone. But they are still behaviors that are, that are given to us by God, that, that God-filled people exhibit and, you know, every biblical commandment or mandate is rooted in inspiration. It is given by God, and we're told to love, and we're told to pray. Any act of obedience, therefore, can be attributed to the Holy Spirit who prompted it because of the inspiration of the Bible. Does that make sense?
appreciate your insight. You're absolutely right. And thank you for reminding us what the previous page, because it's been weeks since, you know. I mean, we, we, may, it, we may take one of the shortest books in the Bible and, and take months to cover it, because uh, we're well on track. <laughs> Uh, but but thank you for reminding us of, of what come before. But you're you're absolutely right. Um, everything that we do in the church and as members of the church in our interactions with the world, we need to make sure that we do it in love. Um, that that everything is seasoned with with love. Um, There's a third possibility as far as praying in the Holy Spirit. Again, he, he's, he's touching these for, for the curious mind, but that, uh, you know, that, that Jude may have been talking about that special kind of communication. Somebody check Facebook, make sure we got sound. I'm, I'm pretty sure that... <laughs> I'll just call him. <laughs> Um, I don't know that that's what that was about um, or they may not have fell back I don't know uh, but that special kind of communication that occurs between the spirit and God somebody read uh, Romans eight twenty six for us So the Spirit intercedes for us when, when we don't even know what to pray for. Um, because, you know, Johnson makes the point that it, it's difficult to ascertain Jude's precise meaning here, but it's probably more beneficial to engage in praying. It's definitely more beneficial to engage in praying than lingering. Hello? Uh, no, he's not. Yeah, I'll, I'll absolutely do it. Right. Yeah, it wasn't that. It was actually, uh, if, if Greg comes in, tell him to call home. Um, so it's definitely, um, it's definitely... As, as far as, you know, getting lost in the academics of what he meant and praying in the Spirit, it, it's definitely more beneficial and more important to focus on pray. Um, somebody read James 5.16. Michael Lahue, because you may still be there. I don't know. All right, what was that last part? The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We need to pray. Um, now, the next thing that he tells us is that we keep ourselves in the love of God, verse 21. You know, John wrote, uh, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Uh, you find that in 1 John 5, verse 3. God's love may also be, may also refer to um, the Lord's love for man. Obedience is the proper response in either case. John 14, 15. If you, the Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandments. How do we express our love to God. We express our love by being obedient. Um, we've talked about this before. Um, parents, do we set rules just so that we can, you know, lord over our children and be wardens and, and, and you know, that's what they think. You're absolutely right. But no, we set rules in place because they're good for them. They keep them safe. They set up healthy behaviors and patterns um, the same as what God has done for us what God expects of us is because he loves us because he has set up 
rules to corral us into healthy behaviors and keep us away from activities that are not healthy for us. Um, okay. I memorized 14, 15, and I didn't memorize that one? That's an honest answer. <laughs> I mean, they're both equally good. And it, one's a direct address, and one's an instruction kind of in a, in a third party, so, but, the, but they're both equally good. They both mean the same thing. Um, but, but yes, we've got to keep the Lord's commandments. And there, matter of fact, turn, turn ahead a chapter um, and read John 15.10 for me, Daryl. I haven't memorized this one, but I've got it in my notes. All right, so if you want to abide in Jesus' love, what have you got to do? And another point that I hadn't really, until this weekend at the conference, the point was made to me, and it's just actually a conversation that I was having over the lunch table. But what does it say that Jesus did? He kept his Father's commandments. So if, if, if our Lord Jesus keeps his Father's commandments, how much more should we work to, because, I mean, you look at Jesus' deed, he's fully God, he's fully human, he's God in the flesh, and he kept his Father's commandments, how much more should we work, of course, we're not going to reach the level that he did because he was fully God and therefore perfect, but how much more should we work to keep his commandments if, if, if he saw it necessary to keep God's commandments? Intimacy with God, and that word, I think it trips some people up. Understand that we have kind of allowed it to become a narrow definition. Intimacy means a close personal relationship or familiarity. Um, and then from that, you know, we have the other, but, but intimacy with God, that close personal relationship and familiarity with God requires submission. We have got to submit to His will we do that by following his commandments. It's not just sentiment. You can't just say, I love God. You've got to show that you love God. How do you show that you love God? By following his commandments. Because um, since you're there, I, it's, um, I may embarrass myself here because James 2.26, I think. Is that right? James 2.26. Faith without works is dead also. I believe in God. I don't do anything to show it. How does anybody know? That's an insightful question. Thank you. You know, if you come home and you never told Priscilla that you loved her, if you never complimented her on her cooking, if you come home and said, honey, and we'll do, hi. <laughs> Touche, sir. Touche. <laughs> but if you... You know, if you went, honey, I got you a brand new dress, and you left the tag on it, it was 98 cents from the thrift store. You know, if... if <laughs> Sorry, Kim. <laughs> but if you didn't do anything to show your love, then, you know, you're offering lip service. Uh, another passage from James. James has just given us so much good. Be doers of the word and not hearers only we've got to do what god says not just hear and go yeah that sounds good so
good insight. Ancient Israel entered into a covenant relationship with God, and it was founded on and maintained by love. And God's love was exhibited by the Exodus, bringing them out of Egypt. It was exhibited by the laws that he gave them to promote a, a, a happy, holy life for, for that nation. Um, the people were, were to return God's love by faithfully observing the stipulations of the covenant. You know, when, when the Israelites kept God's commands, they were blessed. And when they disobeyed his laws, they were punished. And similarly, Christians should maintain their relationship with God by honoring his covenant commands that are revealed in the New Testament. You know, you think about it. Men like Noah, Joseph, Samuel, Daniel, they, they all obeyed God in times of extreme difficulty. You think about Noah. Go out and preach. A hundred years he preaches. Nobody listens to him. Go and, and there's something coming. You need to build an ark. Um, why would I do that? I, you, you need to, I will do it. Noah's life was not easy because of all the effort he put into preaching that, that seemingly re received no fruit and then building the ark. Um, he obeyed God in extreme difficulty. You think about Joseph, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. You think about Joseph. His brothers hated him. They were going to kill him, stop short, and, stole, and sold him into slavery. Potiphar's wife lied about him. He went to prison. The cupbearer made him a promise, didn't keep it, forgot about it until much later. Um, you think about all of the things that Joseph went through, and, I, and then I think about this point that was made this weekend too. Um, if Joseph had not been sold into slavery, if he had not been mistreated by Potiphar's wife, if he had not been put in prison, if, if, if he would have not met the cupbearer, if he had not met the cupbearer, he wouldn't have had the opportunity to interpret dreams for Pharaoh. He would have not made it to be in the second in command, the second most powerful person in Egypt. He would have not been able to bring his family out of famine and into the land of Goshen to where they thrived. Um, Joseph obeyed. Joseph, at the end, when the brothers were apologizing, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. We got to obey even in times of extreme difficulty. You know, these stories are preserved in Scripture to assure that we can see their example and we can know that we can do the same. Faithfulness is possible in the worst of circumstances because God has promised to be there for us. God provides that help. Um, I tell you what, I've got several other points in the lesson today. I'm going to open it up for discussion because we've just got a few more minutes and I don't want to rush and I don't want to miss anything. So, comments, questions, anecdotes. It's like that comedian said, if I knew the difference between an antidote and an anecdote, my buddy might still be here. Saved by the bell. <laughs> all right. All right. Love you all. Hope you have a good... Thanks, Tina. <laughs> Love you all. Hope you have a good week.